very good afternoon everyone i am asmita sent ahead jme and i welcome you all on behalf of jamshedpur management association thank you for joining us today for the webinar in chat gpt and its impact on industry landscape a very interesting and relevant topic in today's times we are joined today by our eminent guests uh, this webinar has been in association with the fine analytics and uh, i am welcoming mr manas agarwal ceo and co-founder of afine Manas is an AI evangelist, business builder, and entrepreneur at heart. As the CEO of Affine, Manas is responsible for promoting client-first culture and ensuring Affine's sustainable growth through driving strategic, transformative, and impact-driven AI capabilities and solutions for global enterprises. He works closely with CXOs from the largest gaming companies to the most reputed luxury car makers, manufacturing giants, and helping them define an executive transformation mandates, leveraging the trifecta of AI, data engineering, and cloud. Having spent his time campus days at IIT Kharagpur and ISB Hyderabad, and his professional stint with marquee organizations like IBM, Dell, and Accenture, he brings the best learning from both academia and industry. At Affine, he continues to build on that to offer more to his clients. Welcome, Manas. I request you to please briefly address the audience. Hey, thanks, Asmita. Uh, can you just let me know if I'm uh, clearly audible? Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. So it's absolutely a big honor to be on this platform. Congratulations, JMA, for continuing to organize such very, very interesting webinars. And uh, Affine has been a you know a proud partner uh, on this platform. We are really grateful to JMA for giving us the opportunity to speak earlier as well as well as today on some very interesting topics. So just before I begin another piece of my own uh, personal background, I wanted to share uh, while I think Asmita mentioned that I started my uh, college days, campus days at uh, IIT Kadapur. I just wanted to let the audience know that I all my schooling before that and my growing up days was in Jamshedpur. So I am a Jamshedpur product as well. Hence, you know, Jamshedpur is always very, very close to my heart. I, uh, you know, did my schooling from uh, multiple schools, uh, St. Mary's, KSMS, uh, and all. And uh, I continue to visit Jamshedpur very often. And absolutely, you know, I'm of the belief that places like Jamshedpur that have a, a industrial upbringing per se, industrial DNA, are set to bring the new talent to the world, uh, bring new solution paradigms to the world. So. JMA's contribution towards nurturing that kind of thought process, thought leadership is absolutely commendable. So thanks once again for inviting me, uh, Asmita and your team. Now just very quickly about uh, today's topic. I think, you know, um, I was writing for, uh, you know, uh, Forbes some time back and, you know, when I was asked that, what do you compare this chat GPT revolution with? I said in terms of the buzz created, it's almost like, you know, when there's a buzz about who will be the next Indian cricket team captain, uh, it's almost that much. But in terms of the impact that it will have and genuinely beyond just the hype of it, it would be as much as what we had with uh, steam engines coming in, then electricity coming in, uh, and then industrial automation coming in. I'm still talking just industrial. I'm not talking at a civilization level. Civilization level, electricity, internet, these are the other you know, inventions that have really fueled a very different growth trajectory for the human civilization. Uh, the large language models and similar other kind of generative AI uh, models that are you know, collectively called Gen AI. This revolution will, uh, this invention will further fuel a similar kind of revolution. Let me just give you a very quick glimpse. Uh, now I'm, I'm sure that every single one of you would have attempted chat GPT and DALI and all to create fantastic personal uh, you know, uh, outputs for your usage. But let's just you know, uh, imagine this very quickly that there's a doctor who has been called very urgently to visit a patient uh, because the patient unfortunately is not keeping well. And instead of the doctor going through the entire summary of the patient's last 10 days hospital records and his or her you know, last you know, few years patient records, the doctor's recommendation could actually get an entire summary through uh, chat GPT in, in real time, right? There's an industrial worker who has gone ahead to fix a particular part of a plant 
or a machinery. He or she will get the maintenance records and what to do with that machine part without having to go through huge voluminous manuals in real time. Right? There is a farmer, you know, somewhere uh, near, let's say, Ghatshila, and he is trying to understand what kind of fertilizer should I use instead of going through multiple you know, pages even available on the government websites and trying to figure out where's the right answer. He or she can use a LLM powered or chat GPT powered kind of application to get the answer. Right. So chat GPT versus a search. Is the difference of when you go for a search on Google, on Bing or any other search platform. You get reference documents of where is this information likely to be available. But when you ask the same question, so when I ask the question, which are the top 10 places to you know, visit in Jamshedpur, I get 10 listings saying that this website also covers it, this website also covers, but the system does not give me an answer to consume. While what a LLM does, the large language model, which is the underlying AI principle, what it does is it creates synthesizes answer. So what are some of the fundamental new capabilities that a LLM enables us with? One, it can understand very large sentences as an English or a complete language sentence rather than as individual words. Right? So when I'm asking which are the top 10 places to visit in Jamshedpur that are also child safe. It understands the entire sentence as a, uh, as a sentence like a human being would. So it, it's not trying to identify the highest number of times Jamshedpur is mentioned, places are mentioned, kids are mentioned. It's not trying to find out that. It's trying to find out an answer to this. Once it gets the right context at multiple places, it then does the next stage, which is synthesize the answer. So it's not just finding out the content. It's also synthesizing that into an answer. Right? If you just keep that in mind and start looking at where you can apply this. The scope is absolutely astounding. Just imagine you know, the work that the supply chain and procurement team has to do going through documents, understanding that you know, did the supplier provide you the material that was written in the contract? Or did it violate any of the terms and conditions of the uh, vendor and the client relationship. Instead of you going through it, you can ask that this yeah. is the challenge, this is the invoice. Is it fulfilling all these things? So this this just you know one example from a very different kind of a world. Uh, let's say supply chain and uh, procurement. Uh, finance could uh, have a very great usage of this. Let's say if they have to look at the last three years, uh, you know financial uh, records to search for something instead of them trying to get the data and then search for the answer. They can actually do a QA and a question and answer, right? If your employees who are distributed across 10 different plant locations want to understand the company's policy and maybe there are certain policies that are different by plant. All that document could be very voluminous. So instead of them going through your intranet website. So maybe 25 years back, these documents were not available online. They were available as an offline document. You write a letter to someone, call them up, they will give you the answer. Then came the era of internet, but all these documents are available online and search is the next step where it was made easy to identify those documents. The next stage is using QA, you can actually get the answer rather than just look at the document. So, what the large language model and generative AI paradigm is doing is allowing you to not not just search for the relevant uh, content, but also create an answer out of it. And it could be applied as I told in multiple, multiple ways. So just imagine now that your organization, you know, let's say if I pick up the likes of Tata Steel, this is an organization that has been around for more than 120 years now. Right? The amount of content, scientific research data, financial data, labor data, machine uh, performance data. This kind of data which could be gold mine for researchers is today available, absolutely available. But if the researchers want to start using that to do new research and you know get answers. LLM can actually enable that. 
and I, you know, just heard uh, our, our honorable uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, speak in a particular, uh, you know, conference where he was talking about uh, AI-powered uh, inter interlanguage translation capabilities. Uh, I think that could be another absolutely, you know, amazing use case, which, especially in a country as diverse as us, could really open up doors for people in any language to consume content of any other language. Just think of the people who currently uh, you know, come speak a language which does not have as much content. Of course, you know, with all due uh, you know, input given, uh, more content will be created in that language also. But if let's say if it's a tribal language, it currently does not have so much of educational uh, content available in that language. Instead of translating that, the system can do a Q&A on any language material, English, Hindi, Bangla, and give them the answer in their own Santali language. Right. So I think hence, you know, if we start just last seven, eight minutes, I think I've been able to put forward very uh, promising 10 to 15 use cases of industrial scale of uh, public usage of business usage and across different kind of functions. So I would highly encourage anybody attending this session to make this session as just an eye opener. Please do your own research also uh, post this conference and try to understand if not the underlying AI itself, it may or may not be easy for many of us to understand, but try to understand the constraints that it has. Where does it go wrong? Because any solution has its own constraints that it does not work good under certain constraints. Look at the capabilities, look at what it can do, possibilities and start imagining your own use case. Trust me, this is something that would benefit each of us if we really understand it well and apply it in our own context. So, you know, on that note, uh, thanks again once again for inviting Afain uh, to this webinar. This is a very, very interesting topic. I hope, uh, you know, my colleague Balu and Satish do a good job of making sure you guys don't fall asleep on a, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, so Satish, uh, uh, you know, over to you guys to make it make sure that the, you know, uh, the webinar remains uh, very, very interesting. And uh, Asmita, thanks a lot for uh, inviting us here. I would love to, you know, go back in the audience and listen in. Thank you so much, Manas, for setting the context of today's session. Now I would like to introduce our speaker of today, Mr. Balu Nair. Mr. Nair is a principal data scientist with the AI Center of Excellence at Affine with a decade's worth of industry experience. A master's graduate of Carnegie Mellon University, he specializes in computer vision and AI, translating his academic excellence into solving real-world business complexities. At Affine, Balu's role extends beyond theoretical constructs, emphasizing product development and the design and deployment of end-to-end -end solutions. His unique application machine learning and deep learning techniques have led to the creation of data-driven insights, aiding businesses in making informed decisions. We're excited to have you on the JMA platform. Let's learn about generative AI and leverage Balu's extensive experience and insights into this fast evolving technology. I now hand over the session to our speaker, Mr. Balu Nair. Thanks, Asmita. Uh, just a quick uh, check. Uh, my voice is coming fine. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'll just quickly share my screen and then uh, walk you guys over uh, through the generative AI, uh, like the developments in this field. I uh, hope you guys can see my screen now. Yeah, it is visible. All right. So uh, just like Manus was talking about, generative AI has actually taken uh, the AI landscape by you know uh, by, by force, and then this is like the new um, in thing in the AI space. So just like a few big events uh, in our, our human existence, right? Generative AI currently is like one of those. So uh, today I'll just quickly walk you through for the uninitiated. Like I'll just quickly maybe tell you what is data science and AI, and then how are they like. Uh, what they are and then talk about generative AI, uh, the key use cases in manufacturing industry and affines uh, generative AI offering um, 
called Genrax, the generative AI suite uh, that FIN has developed, and then few of our client success stories. So talking about data science and AI, uh, AI is nothing but using machines to actually do things which require human intelligence, right? So think about a scenario where uh, you have like data and then you need to understand whether these a bank data, let's assume, and then you want to understand if it's a fraudulent transactions or not, or if these are legit transactions. You, a human who is like trained on that particular data can actually find nuances in the data and then understand, okay, this data is definitely legit. Okay, there is some anomaly here and then this is, uh, you know, a fraudulent transaction. So things like that, uh, which require human intelligence using machines to aid humans in making these decisions quickly and more effectively, right? So that is essentially what AI does, right? Mimicking human intelligence and data science is closely related. Essentially, uh, data science is getting data, understanding the data, and then making informed decisions uh, from the data, right? Uh, using AI models and uh, similar sort of uh, decision making models. So, in this slide, I'm uh, we are essentially talking about DIKW, which is data information knowledge and wisdom. So this is like and what you can actually show data science and AI as a pillar. So uh, just like how I was uh, saying, data uh, and how you essentially approach any problem is first you need the data. So once you have the data, it could be in like any any form. It could be uh, structured, unstructured, right in uh, some uh, database, or it could be in like uh, physical documents. So you actually essentially get the data into some consumable format and then you actually like analyze it. So that is essentially what is descriptive and analytics where you are trying to do an exploratory data analysis on the data to understand what has happened right on the data. Right. And then essentially comes knowledge and wisdom where you actually try to generate um, insights and then valuable uh, sort of decisions from the data. So things that you can do to once you have the data and then pre-process it is things like predictive analytics, right? Where you try to understand if a machine is going to fail at a particular point in time or not. Prescriptive analytics as in uh, before something happens, what you can do, right? Or this is something that could happen and then these are the steps you could take, right? And then cognitive analytics to understand like why certain things are happening and then give you uh, you know, uh, an explainability on like why it has happened and then decisions on how to do it, um, like suggestions on how to do, do it. And finally comes generative AI. Generative analytics is again uh, combining all of them and then uh, it can do most of these and then even generate new content for you in a synthesized format or like completely new uh, format from scratch. So this is essentially a quick slide just talking about like the evolution of AI. So essentially, uh, though from 1950s onwards, you had um, 1950s onwards, people have been like, talking about AI, the concept has been introduced, but then there was this AI winter. Essentially, though these concepts existed, we never had like the compute capability to actually like execute these models, right? And then eventually what happened is, around 2010, right? Uh, after like 1990s, you actually had like more compute capabilities and more interest in this, right? This is kind of like the AI autumn, uh, you could call, where the uh, entire interest had been rekindled. And essentially around this point, like 2017, Google came up with the paper, uh, Google's uh, deep brain uh, division actually came up with a paper called Attention is all I need. Uh, if if you are aware of it, that is where they introduced a concept called uh, transformers. Transformers, think about it as a, um, a model which can actually help uh, give you attention to different parts of a sentence. So essentially, if I tell you, okay, uh, the, uh, there was a mountain in this place, it is very huge. So for traditional machine le learning models to understand it, in the sentence you are referring to the uh, what do you say the mountain 
it doesn't understand that concept really well. Like, OK, the mountain is very big. It it has snow all over it. So it refers to the mountain. Uh, traditional machine learning models couldn't understand that, like it, giving attention to it and mountain and understanding that these are talking about the same thing. So Google came up with something called Transformers, which actually transformed the entire landscape. And then what you see is ChatGPT and other LLM models. It all uses uh, Transformers behind the scene to actually uh, enable this supposed intelligence. So uh, quickly talking about machine learning. Uh, and even in generative AI and all, you have machine learning concepts. You have something called uh, supervised learning or unsupervised learning in machine learning. So machine learning essentially is using mathematical models to help you uh, come up with decisions, right? For helping you this, uh, this uh, to help you come up with decisions on data using mathematical models. So to train a model, you can actually have unsupervised or supervised learning approaches. Unsupervised is traditionally what is generally used where you say that. Uh, like earlier, I was talking about the day, uh, the bank fraud data, right? So you're essentially labeling the data saying that, okay, for this sort of transaction amount, uh, this region, these sort of inputs, this particular uh, row of data belongs to, uh, let's say, it's a fraudulent transaction. And then another row, you can say that it is a non-fraudulent transaction. Essentially, you're labeling the data and then training the model. So it's essentially like, think about, training a small kid, you're telling it, okay, one plus one is equal to two, right? And one plus two is equal to three. You're essentially telling it things and then it remembers it. And the next time when it sees something similar, it can actually answer the question. That is essentially unsupervised learning. And supervised learning are uh, slightly more complicated where uh, the entire, uh, you do not label the data, the machine exa or using certain algorithms, it can understand like, okay. It belongs to a certain class, and then this set of points belong to another set of classes, right? And then deep learning is uh, much more, uh, again, a subset of AI where uh, the network, the model is designed to mimic our human brain. So neural nets are something uh, which is under, falls under the realm of deep learning, right? So the word neural networks is essentially uh, because our brain also has neurons in it. And these uh, these uh, circles that you see is essentially uh, neurons of the neural network, and then you have these sort of connections. Right. So these are the networks where uh, something that again came after machine learning models, which mimic human brain and uh, can understand complex, much more complex data. So talking about generative AI, right? So generative AI essentially, like what Manas was essentially earlier saying, it lets you uh, generate content, right? So when you say generate content, that is not all it can do. So what it can uh, do is see a few points that I've listed over here is learns patterns from existing data, right? So essentially, if you feed the data, it can actually understand that information. Again, using this concept that I said, transformers, it can essentially understand that data and then when you ask questions from the data right so it can actually like learn patterns from it and then produce information so let's say that uh, because i think few of you guys must have already tried out chat gpt so if you ask it okay write me an email uh, you know uh, to call in sick for the day so it will maybe write an email for you quickly but uh, somebody who knows how you write an email when they read it, it might sound artificial or like somebody else had written it for you. But instead, what you can do is uh, give it some samples of some emails that you have written and then say that, okay, uh, you know, I wanted something similar to what this these previous emails look like. Then it can actually learn patterns from it and then make that output sound exactly like how you've written, right? So these generative models using attention can do that. Right. So that is why it's like a very powerful and then it can actually generate like wide variety of data like generative models uh, later in the slide I'll explain. You have a uh, generative model that generate text like like GPT. You have like models which can understand like audio and then generate like audio out of it. 
right? Music synthesis, or like text to speech, right? And then it can understand your voice and then generate something very similar to your voice, right? Images and 3D models. So things like that it can generate. It can even like understand like very complex sentences, context, and generate outputs which can actually mimic like a human output, right? Uh, so you GPT extending the concept to transformers of uh, trained like extremely large models, right? And then to the point that these models to a certain extent can actually like mimic human intelligence. And even uh, it is industry agnostic. So one of the reasons why these models like chat GPT are industry agnostic is it is trained on like huge amounts of data. So data could be like medical manufacturing, right? Like CPG, different sort of industries, um, even like codes, right? Like everything it is like trained on, whatever you can imagine about. So uh, what essentially happens is this model is extremely huge, trains on different sorts of data to the point that uh, for most domains, it can actually work. Like without you fine tuning these models or like giving industry specific documents to it because it's already seen these. So to give you an example, so one uh, word that possibly few of you might have heard is prompt, right? When you're like uh, using chat GPT or like any of the uh, generative image models, one of the words which few of you might have heard is prompt or like prompt engineering. Prompt is nothing but like a uh, instruction, right? A sentence that you actually give to these AI models to explain your task, essentially explaining what you need the model to do. Right, so prompt engineering and uh, the new word like a data scientist or a data engineer, one of the new words that you would have heard like uh, getting floated around is prompt engineer. A prompt engineer essentially like understands how these models work, right? And they design like carefully crafted prompts to help get the most out of these models, right? So prompt engineering in itself is like a lot of trial and error and a lot of understanding of how these models work. So to give you an example over here, you can see, see when you say, when you upload a document and say that, hey, give me the summary of these documents, right? This is like a simple prompt, essentially an instruction to a generative model telling it what to do. You can even tell it, okay, generate an image of a mountain uh, with a river flowing uh, beside it, or to translate something from uh, this into English. So you don't essentially have to tell it which language because it already understands it. Or you can even make it write creative content for you. Right. So like give me a description of something. Uh, we can say like okay, give me a description of a cake or like some new uh, sort of uh, food item that you've actually like uh, cooked, right? So then it will try generating something for you. A prompt engineer will say that, OK, you should say that it's, it tastes sweet or like it is like this low calorie, it's healthy. And then it generates content because your instruction is much more fine tuned, right? So that is essentially what is prompts and then like prompt engineering. So like I was saying, generative AI, you can actually have models which generate text for you, right? Which can generate images and then audio. So when I say generate images, uh, as you can see over here, these are different things that you can do with it. So anything related with text, uh, an extension of it, it can do. So you can like a simple uh, content generation, like writing you an email or creative writing, information retrieval, right? Like uh, earlier Manish was talking about, let's say that you have like tons and tons of document, right? Or maybe let's say manuals, and then uh, somebody who is not very aware of everything, instead of keyword searches, like traditional searches work, you can actually ask, okay, this is my problem, and then what do I do? It can actually understand from all these documents, uh, what is this thing, or like, what is this sort of alarm, or the, uh, what do you say, this sort of error code that has come, and what is the uh, you know, possible solution, or the um, something that the action that you need to take, right? So chatbots, again, Chatbots and all traditionally used to use uh, pretty rudimentary techniques like either uh, rule based or you already have like a set of questions and answers already there, right? So those are pretty restrictive. But with the advent of generative AI, these chatbots are essentially very more capable, 
right? This, these can synthesize answers for complex questions that you ask, right? So um, these actually have a lot of impact, like to have the more customer engagement. Like when people come onto your website and then you have a chatbot based on generative AI, these can mimic like human sort of a behavior and then you almost feel like you're talking to a, another human, right? So sentiment analysis, email generation, a lot of things based on text you can do visually again for generating images, generating video, right? Summarizing video content or image contents, all of these. So um, when I'm talking about like image generation, you would like essentially think, OK, you can generate images, but where do I use these, right? So it could even be like things like you have an image and then you tell it, OK, on this side of the image, I want you to, let's say, generate uh, this like an Eiffel Tower or something. So it could even simply be simply be a picture of you standing there, but you can actually have an Eiffel Tower next to you. And then it will look like extremely real too, right? And then you can say that, OK, uh, the I want like few uh, birds on the sky and then it can add that to it, things like that. So as an extension, there will be like uh, companies which would need uh, to quickly generate uh, creative content for their ads, right? So typically, instead of spend somebody spending like hours generating these images for you, these are like simple prompts you can do and then try out things and then quickly get uh, usable results out of it. So and then again, audio like what is mentioning, uh, generating music, voice synthesis, generation of voices, right? All of these are like uh, very important and then uh, could be used. So a lot of wide variety of use cases in this. Like, so if you have a certain kind of audio signal, you can actually like it needn't be speech al alone. It can be like, let's say some sort of machinery running and things like that. You can actually um, extract relevant information from that and uh, get insights out of it. So talking about a few of the key generative AI technologies, uh, I'm pretty sure like most of you have already heard of chat GPT. Right, chat GPT, like I was saying, it can do a whole lot. Anything based out of text, right? If it's something related to text content, it can understand it and then it can generate, uh, you know, very usable content for a lot of different scenarios, right? So a few other things it can do again is uh, AI, a conversational AI based on a context, right? You can actually have like, uh, multi-language support also for it, right? And then, so for anything related to like uh, text-based things, ChatGPT can do. So we in Affine actually use these LLM models and then actually build solutions for our clients. So a few of the things that we do is, like I was earlier talking about, these though these generative models are trained on a lot of data and then it can do things, uh, like the vanilla model can do a lot of things. You can actually fine-tune these models for like, let's say, certain domain specific documents or text, right? And then actually can have like much better results. So these sort of things, right? Specifically for the client data, doing certain things to actually augment the model, right? And then uh, certain sort of ethical guidelines or a few requirements like that certain clients require. These can be baked in from our side. And I'm um, talking about, so DALI over here is a image uh, based generative model. So DALI and then a few of you might have heard of something called stable diffusion uh, by stability AI. So these models are like extremely uh, great in terms of like quickly generating creative content for you, image based. So you can actually give it uh, simple instructions to generate an image entirely from scratch or alter an existing image. Like I was saying, you are in, Im in an image, you're wearing a, let's say a black shirt. And then you feel that, okay, this image would have looked better if you were wearing a white shirt. So you can essentially tell it, hey, I will change the color of the shirt to white. It can actually do that for you, right? So these small things can be extended to uh, different use cases. And in Affine, again, uh, what we do is like, like I was saying, these prompts uh, have to be carefully designed to uh, give you the desired output. You can, so in a fine, like, I mean, we've uh, done so much of uh, experimentations and so much uh, time we've spent on these. And then in terms of prompts, getting you the, the right results and things like that, uh, we've like done extensive research on it. 
and another model called Codex. Again, uh, by OpenAI, this is used for generating code for you in real time. So now Codex and ChatGPT has kind of like intertwined and then combined into a single thing, single model. So I simply think about like uh, somebody like me who is like writing a, a quick function. So instead of copy pasting some code from somewhere or even uh, quick, uh, let's say error handling and things like that, you can actually ask ChatGPT like, hey, I'm getting this error. What could be the issue? It can understand this and then quickly like uh, help you out over there. So these are the models by itself is like very uh, reliable and very helpful, but uh, with a fine, like within a fine, we actually extend these capabilities to multiple languages, again, supported languages, or even uh, getting you unit test cases for like extremely complex code structures and things like that. So, to kind of talk about traditional AI versus generative AI, right? So, a uh, few of these points, like I was saying, uh, traditional AI is used for making like you can do use it for making predictions, right? Um, like, OK, this is bad or this is good, or you can let it make forecasting decisions and things like that. In generative AI, basically it can generate content for you and also understand, have a me much more meaningful understanding of data for you and generate insights from that, right? And in terms of data requirement, traditional AI compared to generative AI requires much smaller data set, right? And labeled one, generative AI, uh, because the data set requirements extremely large, uh, labeling of data sets is not an option here. Typically, a lot of uh, unsupervised or techniques are relied upon over here. And in terms of output, like I was saying, uh, predictions, classification, forecasting sort of decisions and all it can do. Over here, it is mostly text-based, image-based, and then audio-based outputs. And in terms of creativity, traditionally AI methods have very limited creativity. These are mostly rule-based and then use of using mathematical models. Over here, though math is involved, these are extremely creative models because of this concept of transformers and attention. And training significantly less resources and data is required over here in jet engine models. Uh, the GPU requirements, like the infrastructure that you require for training these models, are extremely uh, costly and then huge. So, and then human involvement. Uh, in traditional AI, uh, most of these are tasks where uh, human involvement are required and human supervision. But in Generative AI, you can actually uh, tell it to do most of the things without any human intervention at all. So things like so you can see the pattern over here. Like traditional AI is slightly restrictive, right? If these are rule based or like uh, mathematical model based where uh, it is designed to do a certain specific task. A generative AI model, um, it can do a whole lot more than traditional AI. Uh, but of course, traditional AI models have, uh, there are certain tasks that only it can do uh, better, but generative AI models, just with like the uh, advent of it itself, I mean, these models are super impressive. So I can't uh, wait to see like what uh, the future holds in this, uh, these models. So again, to quickly talk about uh, the generative AI models in the AI space, uh, everybody would have heard of OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI came up with like models like GPT-4, GPT-3, right, and uh, GPT+. Plus. So uh, these models, based on the size of it, are different. So if somebody uh, in the audience is uh, thinking like, what is different between GPT-4 and GPT-3, right? So GPT-3 is a much more smaller model, right, and GPT-4 is a bigger model. So a uh, bigger model means think about it can hold more information in it in a very uh, rudimentary way if I'm like talking about it. Uh, essentially, the number of parameters in the model are extremely huge compared to three GPT-3. And uh, you can actually understand from the way it synthesizes answers or responds to your queries. These models are way more capable than GPT-3, but for like most scenarios, GPT-3 works really well too. 
DALI is an uh, image generation model. Whisper again is was a model by OpenAI, uh, which again in FIND we uh, use, which can actually understand audio data and convert it into uh, text-based information. So extremely complex, uh, like with multiple people talking and things like that. Whisper can uh, translate, I mean, uh, transcribe them into text uh, quite easily. Hugging Face, again, is a platform where you can actually use a lot of open source LLM models and traditional AI ML models. All of these are hosted on Hugging Face. Stability AI. And stability AI, like I was saying, stable diffusion, uh, using stable diffusion models. These compared to DALI, uh, slightly more newer technique than what DALI has been using, and these actually work uh, really well in terms of uh, generating content. So, um, alphabet. So, Google, uh, though in the AI space right now, uh, though they're catching up uh, compared to GPT 4 models and all, these are like uh, not uh, there yet. So, some of the models that an equivalent of GPT that uh, Google has is called BARD, and then they even have a model called Palm uh, model. So, these models are actually baked into a few of their um, cloud offerings, which we can use. And Microsoft, again, Microsoft and OpenAI has tie ups, and then a lot of their offerings are using GPT models. So, using things like GitHub Copilot, like if you're coding to help you with the code, like I was earlier talking about, and things like Office 365 Copilot. Uh, so, if you have an Excel sheet, if you want to quickly uh, generate some content out of it and things like that, uh, let's say plots, meaningful plots, things like that, then Microsoft has few offerings, which is again like uh, using OpenAI's model. OK, so this is again uh, what the earlier slide was talking about, like generative AI is essentially for text, image, video, audio and code, right? And then you actually have like few models, few uh, big uh, players which are actually like offering models for this. So uh, one of the things like again Meta, which is earlier Facebook, has their own LLM models called Llama, which again works uh, pretty well, but compared to OpenAI models, these are smaller models and then uh, the capability is not that uh, not compare not that comparable to gpt4 models quickly going to the next slide so i'm quickly talking about the benefits and the challenges right of these models so like i was earlier talking about these generative models can understand uh, your data right or your question and because it's trained on a large corpus of different type of data it can um, it is like what do you say somebody who is who knows everything right so you ask it to do, uh, write a poem for you or like uh, uh, something a poem that rhymes with uh, a, a poem that uh, the last word rhymes with let's say arrow every time so it'll say something arrow uh, something else let's like narrow all these things, right? So it is like if you guys haven't tried it out, definitely try it out. It's pretty uh, impressive, like what it can do for you. So this can be extended to different things. So it can enable you to like generate tailor-made content for you, right? In the later slides, I'll actually tell you a few of the use cases, right? Where you can leverage this to generate tailor-made content for you. And, and also like these things can actually, let's say that you are in the space of writing creative content or like even images, right? It can actually aid you in your creative journey, right? So things like that. So you, you don't have to essentially use the product or the output as it is, but it can actually give you an inspiration or like a direction to move from there quickly, right? So in a lot of ways, these things have uh, amazing benefits, right? In terms of cost saving, because time is money and then it can actually generate things for you very quickly, right? essentially um, helping you save a lot of time. And also these solutions can be like scaled into large, uh, uh, like scaled easily so that it caters to a larger audience um, within or outside the company. But again, the challenge is though these are trained on a huge volume of data, sometimes, you know, if it's a specific domain and specific sort of uh, 
uh, uh, let's say in a specific industry, they're using uh, industry specific lingos and things like that. Right? Let's assume that within uh, data itself, right? So when something like that happens, uh, these models by default do not work. Right? So at that point, you need like some um, data to actually uh, retrain it, which over there, uh, sometimes getting the right data and then the right volume of data and on, it can be uh, sometimes uh, sometimes challenging. So having a representative data so that you get the right sort of a output without biases uh, can be sometimes challenging and then safeguarding against malicious use. So uh, though there are a lot of safeguards on it, people still tend to use these sort of models for malicious use cases. Um, and uh, one of the things though, uh, which has GPT-4 and all in model interpretation as in uh, why the model gave you this output. In traditional AI, you have like things like uh, ex few, a concept called explainability AI, where you can use things like GradCam or SHAP, um, a few uh, like line values, few concepts like that to understand why a model gave you a certain decisions. In uh, generative models, it's not as uh, straightforward. Like a model gives you a certain decision to understand or interpret why it gave you that output is not that straightforward. And uh, finally, uh, these uh, copyright uh, legal implications and all like, let's assume that I created some content out of it. Somebody else used GPT to create a content which is similar to mine. And then a uh, few implications, uh, you know, complications around that. So yeah, these are some of the challenges around that. And uh, talking about like key, key use case in the manufacturing industry. So this is why if you, if you can actually like uh, relate to like how these things can be used, right? So think about, uh, so one of the use cases, root cause analysis of uh, preventive maintenance use cases, right? So think about like you uh, want to identify why a particular machine fail, right? Or if you have like, uh, you know, uh, tons of machine log data, and then you want to understand certain aspects of from that logs, right? So traditionally, what would happen is somebody who is a domain expert would sit and understand the data and then try to come out with like answers for it. But over here, these models can actually be used to um, understand like patterns from your data and with careful prompt engineering telling it, OK, this is what you need to look for. And then if these things are happening, then uh, you need to tell me like this is the root cause and things like that. you essentially tell it. These are what you're looking for in the data and it can actually go through these huge volumes of data and then give you the right output without uh, somebody having to explicitly supervise it right? or uh, developing like in the traditional uh, AI, AI space where you need to get the data, train the model and things like that. Over here, the output is generated much significantly faster, right? Without having to uh, generate training data for you, right? So in a lot of these cases, doing a lot of quick audit operations or understanding from a, getting understanding from a larger, a lot of machine logs, right? Uh, failure log data and things like that. It can actually like uh, significantly sp uh, speed up the entire analysis process right and i was just like how, how i was talking about earlier um these models which can understand data and even like talk back to you so these sort of things can actually like in certain sort of use cases where uh you know you don't want the operator to buy you know quickly like able to uh talk to somebody like talk to an ai and then um, get the ai to essentially carry out the task for you, right? So these are the requirements where you do not want somebody to kind of um, start safe handling or any of those, the hands-free operation. So over there, like uh, these recent models are like significantly advanced that uh, it can understand your voice even when you have a lot of background noise, right? So denoising techniques are like significantly advanced in these models. And so using these, you can actually have um, you know, a completely hands free and at the same time, like safe environment where these models are extremely reliable. And uh, another use case would be so this is something that we again did for uh, 
somebody like within our company. So uh, product review analysis. So think about uh, typically you guys must have heard of sentiment analysis, right? Sentiment analysis essentially using uh, natural language processing techniques where again how you would uh, do in traditional AI modeling is you will have let's say in case of movie reviews right you will have a positive review and then say okay this is a positive review you give a review you say it's a negative review and then you when you train the model it is essentially understanding words positive words negative words and then some sort of uh, you know uh, a little bit of context from the entire sentences and it will understand okay so these are positive these are negative and the next time when when you give a review it can tell you that okay uh, it is a positive or a negative review over here you do not even create training data like that right because these models have an understanding already because of these um, the way it is trained using attention it understands what is a positive sentiment what is a negative sentiment so let's assume that you have like twitter uh, twitter reviews right uh, for, a, for a certain product or it could be uh, like somebody who's purchased your product and then on your website leaves a review so to quickly understand so just instead of just simply saying you got 10 positive reviews and then uh, three negative reviews it can essentially tell you what are things that people liked about your product and what are things that people didn't like about your product right and things like that so uh, it it actually like opens up this entire uh, product review analysis scope in the sense that it can tell you exactly what are things people actually resonated with in your product what are things that people didn't really like right so for example like let's say an airline and then you want to understand like the food on a particular flight what are things that people liked and what are things people didn't like so using traditional ai to understand that information is extremely hard but over here you can essentially tell it Okay, tell me like what are the kind of things that people like. So it'll say that okay, so this sort of food like these tandoori items and things like that are people what people like. Okay, the continental food was very bland. Now things like that, right? So it can actually tell you exactly what things people liked and what thing, thing, things people didn't like, and uh, things like that. So uh, you know, helping you take business decisions. Uh, these all becomes like extremely fast and then much more. Uh, organized and then everything is available for you so quickly right so that is basically what product review analysis using generative AI looks like and call center analysis again uh, think about uh, you can essentially replace like a human over there with like some sort of intelligence like this chat GPT right so uh, let's assume that somebody comes into your uh, onto your website and then wants to understand about a product like i said traditional sort of assistance virtual assistants have a rule based or like you have predefined question answers so next time when a uh, user asks a question you are essentially doing things like a few techniques like name and name entity recognition or keyword matching like rudimentary techniques to understand if your question is similar to or similarity search and things like that to understand if uh, the already uh, predefined questions is as similar to, you know, in the is any of those similar to one of the questions that the user asks, and you pull out the answer, right? Instead of that, over here, even if the user gives a very complex sentence, right, it can understand the sentence, go into your documents or like the uh, data that you have, and answer questions for you. If somebody asks, okay, tell me about uh, these sort of heavy machinery, or like. Uh, what kind of uh, grades of steel or something are like um, available for this sort of use case and things like that. So if you have that information, you don't have to explicitly create question answer pairs or anything of that sort. It understands your question and gives you, you know, a very good synthesized answer, which is extremely relevant to the user's query. So it essentially enhances like your entire customer support experience for the user right and then uh, the entire efficiency of the entire process it is also like uh, extremely like high so these sort of things uh, compared to traditional approaches now it is so much more better and uh, talking uh, like what i was essentially talking about earlier like document retrieval is like an extension of it 
think about like you have large volumes of data. And then you want to get answers out of it. So instead of somebody doing keyword searches or any of that, um, these can actually like understand uh, text from your document and uh, give you like good answers, right? To give you an example, let's assume that in your uh, company you have a lot of HR documents. So a new, uh, let's say a new employee comes in and then they want to understand like a few of the HR related policies, let's say leave related policies. So instead of having to read through the documents, let's assume that somebody traditionally, how would you do it? You open the PDF, you check for casual leave, a few of those keywords, and then read the paragraph that you think is relevant, right? Uh, so sometimes leave might be there in 10 places, and then it is not that efficient. You spend like maybe two or three minutes trying to find your answer. And so that over here, let's assume you were asking GPT or one of these generative models, like, okay, what is the leave policy in the company? And it can essentially find out the relevant text, right? And then give you a very good synthesized answer, saying that, okay, these many leaves are there, but um, it is only credited once a year. Uh, the leaves are credited quarterly, things like that, right? So the answers are much more uh, comprehensive, and uh, the entire process of finding information from huge corpus of data is much more streamlined and fast. So this uh, the HR use case is something that I just came up with. So similarly, uh, for business decision makers, like if you have uh, documents, emails maybe, and then you want to understand like quickly uh, what was discussed on this defect, right? So you have 10 MOMs and then you don't want to read through it. You quickly ask something and then it can actually like synthesize answer for you effectively. So things like that can be done now much more easily. And uh, this is something again that we've done for uh, one of the travel clients. So creating campaign emails and content generation. So think about like you uh, are using over here, you use a model like ChatGPT and stable diffusion where you are creating, uh, you know, you're using these models to write creative content for you, right? Engaging content for your users. So let's say that you are somebody who wants to travel to, let's say, Maldives, and then you search uh, for some, certain things, and then but you didn't go ahead and finish the booking. Let's assume that after you did that, uh, instead of a campaign manager or like somebody at the organization finding out, okay, for these users, this sort of content. So they would like manually write these emails, right? What image to put, things like that. They will decide and then. Uh, they'll identify target audiences and send these out. So instead of that, let's assume that you have a combination of GPT and stable diffusion models there, which can uh, quickly do these things for you, like automatically generate content with the images, everything in a very personalized way based on your browsing history and everything and send out the email for you, right? So it'll be like significantly less time, right? And then it's much more targeted. And then for every user, the content would be uh, unique in its own way, right? Because you're using information based on that user to generate these contents instead of uh, finding buckets of users. And then for all these users, you're firing a single sort of a market uh, target. I mean, uh, like some ad email, right? So things like that. And uh, over here again, uh, product prototype design. So these again are much more complex uh like modeling approaches where you can actually use generative ai to design prototypes for you a simple example would be let's say that you're designing chairs right you can actually give it restrictions on like okay i want it to have three legs or like four legs it should be like this and then quickly it can actually design 3d uh, images for you right so prototypes uh generating prototypes uh quickly Right. So using these sort of models, you can actually generate these things like extremely efficiently. Right. So your creative process is actually like offloaded to the AI. It generates something for you. And then based on your own uh, experience, you can actually like build on those uh, creative outputs that have come up. Right. So it actually like facilitates a lot more innovation. Right. 
and the entire task of creative exploration is like speeding, right? It's uh, sped up, and then you can actually uh, use that time to for like uh, generating more, uh, you know, uh, more designs, I guess. So, and uh, finally, like personalized product variation. This again is an example, like I was talking about earlier, uh, using, uh, you know, you can actually like create personalized products based on like customer preferences, right? Uh, certain customers have a certain preference and things like that. And then you can use these generative AI models to generate, you know, a product variations uh, based on that particular client's uh, interest, right? So again, these are the things essentially are huge in terms of time and cost saving for you, right? And then in terms of the customer engagement or how satisfied the customer becomes at the end of the day, these uh, metrics are like uh, improved by a lot. Okay. Right. And I know I'm like running a little short of time. I'll quickly go through these. Uh, so uh, Affine, like earlier I was talking about, Generax is Affine's uh, AI product suite. So uh, these are like enterprise ready products that we have. And then so mostly in Generax, we have uh, Retriever and creative so retriever is essentially we are heavily using gpt over here and um, what is essentially does is like it can actually um, does it can it's a suite which can actually do a lot of things which are uh, text related so for example a retrieval like i said you have a whole lot of documents quickly getting you like insights from these documents generating summaries for you, right? Uh, if you have meeting recordings, it could be in text form, audio, right? You can just upload it and then ask questions out of your um, documents or the text that you uploaded. So it actually like, uh, so it's not just a search, it is something much more than that, right? Leveraging generative AI, these are able to actually do things like uh, on any text that you upload, do things like sentiment analysis, uh, generating like creative content for you, right? E for email campaigns, things like that. So all of these are baked into a single product. And then uh, this is like uh, one of the offerings that we have. And creative is a platform uh, where we are using uh, image-based generative AI models, right? To uh, create like uh, creative content for you. So like I said, image generation video, Right, few of these things are what we can do. So to quickly tell you about the retriever again in detail, see uh, what essentially happens is you have when you have a bunch of documents, which again could be PDF, text file, Excel files, audio doc, audios, right? You upload them, and then we have like our own like uh, secured document repositories uh, with good practices where it's uploaded, and these are indexed, right? So indexing is again a process of when you have a lot of data right these uh, gpt models have something called a token limit like imagine you have 100 documents you can put in all the 100 documents uh, into gpt at once to ask questions out of it they should be like indexed in a specific way and next time when you ask a question you essentially find out these are the chunks of data which are relevant to your question and send those to get your answer. So these are things that we need to actually build behind the scene uh, indexing engine to actually help with something like that. So if it's a small document, directly you can ask questions out of it. But when you have tons and tons of documents, few things like an efficient indexing engine, right? And at the end of the day, like I was mentioning, prompt engineering comes into a huge play over here, right? When a user asks questions, you essentially need to define the prompt in a certain way right where you get really good answers you do not want gpt to answer uh, questions which are not relevant to your documents or give you false information right if the information is not available in your document you do not want gpt to create some answer for you right it, it you would rather want it to tell tell you that okay i couldn't find this information uh, on this document but this is something similar to your question maybe this will help Right, so you know, ability to give those sort of answers, right? So these are a few things that we've done on the TV, right? 
So we have <clears throat> we're using large language models like GPT and open source models also where uh, you know the data privacy is like at most and that you do not want anything going on. But right now using Azure Open AI services, all these can be handled. Right. And um, we have like pay as you go models for uh, for users for clients uh, if uh, because you do not want uh, and then uh, <clears throat> pay as you go model with recurring costs and then with no long term commitments and things like that. And then it is just easily ready for you to use. You upload your documents, any content, and then it can uh, find information for you from those documents. So again, using the Retriever, uh, like the, the, the use cases earlier when I was talking about uh, one of the use cases that we are actually developing right now is for invoices where you upload your invoice and then let's assume that you want to extract relevant content from that into let's say your structured database right so things like that earlier uh, let's assume that you have an invoice in one form and another vendor's invoices in another form right earlier extracting these information was like extremely hard now using these models uh, with our platform like you can actually extract these invoice amount let's say invoice amount taxes other shipping from address to address right in one invoice shipping address would be on the top in the second one it might be on the bottom it doesn't matter right as long as these are the entities you tell the uh, platform that these are the entities you want to extract it can find that information and then you know automatically like enter it into the database for you so you do not need a human in the loop right to actually like uh, do these manual things. So if it scan documents, anything, it can extract the information and then do it for you. And creative, like I was saying, it's a, a image based uh, generative uh, suite where uh, it lets you quickly generate uh, creative images for you. So let's assume that uh, you have a product and then you say that, OK, I want this product. Let's say assume in this example, a shoe. And then you are saying that, OK, I want uh, the shoe over here like see it needs there needs to be a road right and the track behind uh, the new gray shoe so it kind of generates images for you you can even go ahead and tell it that okay the lighting needs to be like this i want a close-up shot or uh, a wide angle shot things like that so the entire process of generating creative images for like any sort of uh, advertisement purposes right uh, these sort of this is one of the use cases using the platform. You can actually have multiple versions, right, of the same image generated using simply a text, right? So it is essentially helping you save a lot of time in terms of this. So you generate an image, you feel like something can be tweaked in this image. You use this as a baseline image and then kind of give uh, prompts to actually enhance the image even further, right? You can give it feedback and then it translates back into it and then improves it, right? And finally, getting the right, the final perfect image for you, right? So the benefits include like it doesn't depend on like what your uh, company is based on, right? And then it can actually like reduce a whole lot of dependency on your creative folks, right? Even somebody like me can actually like uh, as long as I'm a little bit creative, I can actually like write the right kind of prompts and get this thing out quickly, right? So it is essentially helping you unlock a lot of creativity quickly. So uh, this is like I think the last slide talking about the client success stories over here uh, in a fine. We have used Retriever successfully for them to actually uh, augment them, augment their uh, like a QA bot search bot for them. So they have like this client actually had like a whole lot of documents, right? And then we are using our retriever platform for them to actually generate meaningful insights and then meaningful uh, answers based on the questions that they ask. Them. So, like I was mentioning, retriever uses a pretty complex indexing methodology behind the scenes, which actually makes this entire process effective. Uh, using the generator models and then it can actually synthesize these models like in few seconds every time you ask a question a couple of seconds you have the answer already in front of you 
so essentially helping the client reduce uh, time in like searching or like somebody man be going through these documents right and uh, for let's say that you can even have uh, multiple users log into the platform users simultaneously um, and even have uh, let's say that few the management maybe the hrs can have like hr related documents finance folks can have finance access to finance related documents right somebody like higher up in the management can have visibility on all the documents things like that so uh, these sort of things are all like things which can be baked into it right and uh, again the another thing that we did for uh, uh, travel giant in the us again is a uh, telegram based chatbot that we built so again over here what we're doing is uh, we essentially have to use a lot of prompt engineering and fine tuning of these models based on the data that is coming in and you can actually within the telegram bot it helps you book an entire ticket so you're saying that hey help me book a ticket and then it says that okay what what day do you want to travel and then what is the to and from this to and fro destinations right so you it asks you a few questions you give it and then it helps you like uh, do the entire booking seamlessly right so this is again something that we've done and then uh, we like successfully deployed at our client location all right so i think i went over these things a little too quickly but i hope you guys uh, could understand and follow like most of the things that i was talking about so i think uh, yes mr so i mean if somebody has any questions i can maybe answer them yes surely thank you for the wonderful presentation we do have some questions in the chat box and uh, so Mr. Rana Das, okay, he has raised his hand. So let's answer his question first. Hi, hi, good afternoon, Mr. Nair. I think excellent. Thanks for uh, you know uh, sharing this uh, you know subject, which is uh, you know a sketchy for us for the manufacturing guys. But yes, I think uh, it was a good session. So quickly, uh, you know, uh, uh, just wanted to understand commonsensically that. You know, there are data which are residing not on the, uh, you know, public forum or in, in the intra internet platform, but those are all, you know, in, in uh, uh, data which are residing in the ERP of some specific uh, companies or the intranet or, or, or the, you know, share po share points, etc. Okay, can uh, uh, the AI uh, would take uh, you know inputs from those set of data which are not in the public domain yeah of course so all of these uh, models uh, they can be uh, like specifically used for your document so let's assume that you have your document let's say in a particular server within your company right you said like sharepoint so you specifically need to uh, like we can actually help you like develop these data connectors and then with our platform we can actually link it so next time when you ask questions, it is referring to your documents, which could be residing anywhere, right? And you can actually ask questions specific to it. So it needn't be in any public domain accessible to everybody. It could be on a private server, and then these can be linked to it to access your information. So you need a kind of a connector to get this data accessed by the, AI, by the AI. Correct. So if you have a let's say that's uh, very uh, confidential information uh, that you do not want to Absolutely. send anywhere. So that is where you would actually uh, host the solution at your end on your servers so that this data like never leaves anywhere. Right, so you can ask questions and then it would connect to your database, your private database and answer questions for you. So yeah, that is possible. Thanks. Thank. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is. OK, um, OK, they haven't shared their name, but uh, they're asking how to implement uh, this in daily work activities. Would you like to elaborate your question? Yeah, daily activities. So like I said, I mean, as simple as let's say that in the morning you wake up with a cold or fever and then you quickly want to write a out of office mail to your boss. You can ask CPT to quickly write it for you. 
it could be that uh, like in my case sometimes let's say that i uh, want to uh, write a small function to do certain tasks let's say convert a color image to a grayscale image you can ask something like that and it writes the code for you so these are the things using just gpt alone you can do it but you can extend it using tools to like uh, for specific use cases like i was discussing earlier Okay, I think he he was referring to any use of data chat GPT like models in our data anal analysis, big spreadsheets, etc. Oh yeah, of course. So this is something again you can do. So if your data is in spreadsheets, or let's say that uh, people use things like Tableau or Power BI, right, to actually generate insights, plots to understand your data and then make uh, business decisions, right? So using GPT. Right, and then careful prompt engineering, you can actually extract data and then based on your question. So uh, you can actually like simply give something like, so this is again something that we are actually working on and then we have something in a fine where you ask a question like, okay, generate like uh, meaningful insights from this data. Or you can ask like, okay, how many, uh, let's say chairs were sold uh, in this region? Uh, in the first quarter, right? things like that. Uh, you can actually like generate plots at the same time. Instead of writing like SQL queries, it will generate it for you. So you ask a question on in natural language itself, and then uh, using our tool, you can actually generate SQL behind the scene, extract the information from your let's say database, and give you the data in a relevant consumable format. So yes, of course. So Excel or any sort of database, as long as it's such a data, you can get that information. Great, that would be very useful, I think. Thank you. Uh, the next question is how to use OpenAI for making a good project report. Can you please share related prompts for this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I could share the prompt with you, like offline I can share it with you. So typically, if you want to generate project reports, right? Um, or even let's say that from uh, let's say that you have a report and then you want to generate uh, a deck quickly out of it. So these are things that you can actually use do using GPT and uh, let's say these sort of uh, generative AI models. Right? You're talking about let's say that you're generating a report for let's say something green uh, greenhouse gas emissions or things like that. So you would want images on your slides which are related to your document. But at the same time, uh, you need bullet points and not too wordy, but at the same time, enough content so that people can understand. Right. So you can essentially say that, OK, I can I want a five page deck, right? A five slider deck. And then these are the headings that I want in each of those five day, five slides. I right? think like these. So and it generates the content for you. And then from there, you have a starting point. You can actually refine it yourself or Maybe in the first go itself, you get a good thing. So from a report, you can generate decks or if you have content, if you give it the right sort of requirements like you want, you can generate uh, you know, a meaningful report for you. So yeah, uh, so I see a question where uh, you can't it make like human unimaginative and creative. No, at, this end, at the end of the day, I think humans are pretty creative creatures. I think it was not going to make us like irrelevant or like less creative. I uh, think of it more as tools which are aiding you in your creative journey, right? So uh, at the end of the day, like these models can aid you, right? But they are not going to replace you, at least not for some more time, I believe. Right. Thank you. Are there any more questions uh, for Mr. Balun Ayer? Yeah, Mr. Somi Dipto Sen has raised his hand. Yes, please. Uh, good evening. First of all, thank you for such an informative session. So I have a very uh, generic question being uh, uh, I've started using ChatGPT for a couple of months, so most of us are doing that. So just uh, one question out of curiosity is how do you upload documents or uh, I was going through your uh, PPT. There was a uh, slide on it, which was saying that there, there is an organization uh, which helps us do it. There's something called prompt engineering. But is there a way in which we can do it or is it's not allowed? So, Samya, one thing using the chat GPT interface, 
if you want to do it, uh, there is something called GPT plugins. OK, so if you are using the platform, if you're using the plus subscription, you can actually get like uh, plugins which help you upload documents. But the problem with that is there is a limitation of the size of the document. Let's assume that you have a hundred page document, right? If it's a few couple of pages and all it works, right? Because you would have seen that like, chat GPT has something called token limits. Right? GPT-4 has uh, a token limit. GPT-3 has like some 4,000. GPT-4 has some 8,000 something token limit. So if you have like extremely large documents, that is where you would fail to get answers from that large document. But uh, so as long as your document is small and if you have the chat GPT plus subscription, you have something called GPT plugins over there where you can. Uh, there are plenty of good plugins over there which can actually you can select it and it lets you upload a PDF document or text document ask questions from it. OK, I hope that answered your questions on Our uh, next uh, question is by Mr. Rajesh Das. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi Baluj. My question is in general about AI and uh, tools like uh, on, uh, large language models like chat GPT. Uh, you know that this is owned by a private firm and uh, it is the control. The source code is controlled. It is also said that uh, how chat GPT works, uh, nobody actually understands because the source code is very closed and it, it is owned by a private firm. So uh, what do you think? How can this be controlled? How do we uh, exactly uh, know that uh, uh, chat GPT is not self aware or sentient or uh, is it not, uh, you know, uh, super intelligent, more intelligent than humans? Uh, whatever we want, we do not want anything, any technology more intelligent than humans, of course. So uh, who owns the data that uh, chat GPT reads from our servers, from our corporate, uh, you know, systems and who owns that data? And what's the guarantee that uh, chat GPT will forget these? So what is the security part of it? Yeah, so Rajesh, to answer your question, like uh, OpenAI initially when they came out with that, uh, their policy was whatever questions you ask uh, the GPT model, all of this information is actually retained over there. Let's assume that you are uploading some proprietary code within your organization and then asking it to uh, develop some unit test cases for you. So this code, everything is retained over there and trained used for training like subsequent models. This was how their uh, data privacy uh, policy guidelines were uh, initially. But then what has happened is because of these concerns that you mentioned, right? Uh, what all data do they retain? What do they use it for? Because of that, now we have like explicit options to actually uh, tell it not to save these sort of data. So these are governed by now guidelines and uh, these data you can tell it not to retain. Right? And even if you go through uh, platforms like Azure's OpenAI, right over there you have like uh, much more control over like uh, enterprise level controls on like your data not leaving to any uh, like uh, you know not getting misused and things like that. Where you have much more greater control over it. So uh, right now, as of right now, uh, these models are if you want to opt out of any of these uh, data getting retained you can do that and also even now uh, if you use the public uh, chat gpt uh, the interface during the session it retains it and then you can actually tell it to uh, forget the data even right so i think if you had seen there is an option currently so right now like rajis i don't think uh, it is too much of a concern when they launched it initially yeah the, all this data would have been used yeah. and to uh, uh, th answer thanks. Your, yeah um, yeah, but what my concern is, uh, what if I you know share my organizational's uh, proprietary data with Chat GPT, and the model itself so, you know gathers or generates some in, uh, you know intellectual property out of it, and that intellectual property used uh, is used by some other firm or some other organization, or probably Chat GPT retains it for uh, you know super intelligence purposes. So how do we guarantee? Because the system itself is closed; it's owned by a private firm. Correct. So over here, Rajesh, like I said, right now using Azure's uh, OpenAI platform and all, you have much more uh, like uh, stricter control 
over like what information leaves or like if you do not want any information to leave, these can be controlled. But if um, you are like extremely worried about the data, then what you can actually do is instead of using these large language models uh, like from OpenAI, ChatGPT, you have like plenty of other LLM offerings. Like you have uh, offline models like um, let's say like uh, few to give you a few examples. There are models like Llama, which is by Facebook. There is uh, Dolly by Databricks, right? Yeah. So these models are slightly more smaller than GPT and then you might not get the, uh, you know, uh, that same level of performance as GPT. But in certain cases, this is something that we've actually uh, seen at our end. Like for certain use cases, it is more than enough capable, right? So if you're worried truly about your data leaving your uh, organization and then you do not trust, like even when uh, Azure or OpenAI says they don't retain your data, even then, if you're like worried about that, you can very well use uh, completely offline LLM models, right? So your data never leaves. It's completely on your premise and it is a completely offline implementation that can be done too. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mr. Sanjay has a question. Uh, let's uh, take this as the last question. Yes, Sanjayji, please go ahead. It was really very nice and you know there was a lot of insight which we gained from your presentation. Oh, you know, thank like you. Uh, so many things are happening in this field. So, uh, you know, out of curiosity, I'm asking if you can quickly see what is the direction that this AI generative AI or, uh, you know, some other AI in this field is going to take place. What sort of capabilities are to going to come up in terms of complexity or the nature of work which is happening? Since you're in this field, maybe you can give, uh, you know, a lot of insight about this. Yeah, Great. so uh, to be frank right now, GPT-4, uh, one of the things, see, uh, this GPT-4 with the advent of GPT and GPT-4 models, right? Well, there is a concept in AI called uh, Artificial General Intelligence, AGI. So Artificial General Intelligence would be like, if you think about us, right, as a human, you can understand like image data, right, and then make decisions from it. You can hear things, you can make decisions. So any sort of inputs can come to a single model, right? I mean, a single human being, and then they can understand things and then, uh, you know, essentially take decisions, right? So one thing that is slightly uh, going to happen is with models like GPT-5 or 6 coming up, this concept of artificial general intelligence where a single model can understand like multiple types of data, a single model, because right now GPT doesn't understand image data. Like you can't upload like an image data and then uh, make it understand things. Right? It can only understand text. Right? There are certain certain other traditional AI models that you can build to understand models to tell it uh, to help you tell if there is a defect in an image or there is no defect. Right? So models like GPT and all can't do it currently. So one thing that is going to happen in this generative AI space with these sort of models like GPT-4, something called artificial general intelligence is going to come up where these models at that point probably it's a little scary where this models can understand pretty much all sorts of information and uh, can kind of almost mimic human intelligence right but again if you understand like how these models work behind the scene using this thing called transformers uh, that google came up with and then with attention it is only because it can understand context much better than our previous traditional models. It seems like it's very intelligent, right? But these models are not per se, what do you say, uh, there yet where it is like completely autonomous and then it can uh, make decisions, uh, you know, like a human being without, uh, it's not sentient. Okay, so. But artificial general intelligence, I think something like that will come up eventually, I think with GPT-5 possibly. And then I think that will open up a whole lot of things and a lot more use cases uh, where you do not have to combine different models. Everything works seamlessly in a single model and then that'll be way more powerful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. 
thank you Sanjeevji for the question and thank you uh, Mr. Balu for the uh, for answering the questions patiently. Now I would request uh, Mr. Satish Agawat uh, to please present the vote of thanks. The vote of thanks today. So on behalf of the GMA platform, it is my great pleasure to extend a heartfelt vote of thanks to Mr. Manas and Mr. Balu for the incredible session on chat GPT and its impact. This session has been truly enlightening and has provided us with valuable insights into the world of artificial intelligence and its applications. Balu, your expertise and passion for the subject were evident throughout the entire session. Your ability to simplify complex concepts and present them in an engaging manner is truly commendable. You have effortlessly guided us through the intricacies of ChatGPT, allowing us to grasp its capabilities and understand the transformative potential it holds. It has revolutionized the way we interact with technology and opened up our world of possibilities. We would like to express our gratitude to the JMA platform for organizing this insightful webinar by bringing together experts like Balu and Manas. You have provided us with a platform to learn, grow, and stay up to date with the latest advancements in the field of artificial intelligence. Lastly, we extend our deepest thanks to all the participants who joined us today. Your active engagement and thought provoking questions have enriched the discussion and made this webinar a success. We are grateful for the knowledge and insights you have shared with us, and we look forward to future collaborations and opportunities to learn from your expertise. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. With this, I announce the session has ended. We look forward to seeing you in all our further events. Please share your valuable feedback by scanning the QR code on the screen and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.